Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Um, my name is Ben Stopford. Uh, I work at um, a company called Confluence. Uh, company, uh, Confluence is a, um, one of the companies which sit behind the uh, open source streaming platform Apache Kafka. Um, so today we're going to be talking a bit about Kafka. I'm also going to be talking about some other things. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, functions as a service, serverless, and um, quite a bit on stream processing. And uh, yeah, particularly this, this notion of uh, state, and this problem of state, which flows through um, a lot of the programs that we end up writing. So streaming um, as, a, as a concept sits at quite an interesting intersection between how we deal with data and how we deal with programs. So often we'll put our data in a database and we'll have like a stateless application layer. Where streaming sort of blends these things together by making, um, making our data something that's available through a stream of events, a constant stream of events. So at the heart of this is uh, Kafka. Um, who's familiar with Kafka? Right, quite a few, that's good. Um, so at its heart, it's a messaging system. So that's kind of that bit in the middle. Um, but there's actually a whole ecosystem. So if you download the Apache project, uh, then you'll actually find that there's a number of different elements to this uh, other than just the messaging system. There's Connect APIs, which sit on both sides. So they allow us to um, extract data from a variety of different data sources. So these could be databases, they could be Twitter, things like that, uh, MQTT proxies if you're doing IoT, those kind of things. This is just how you get data into Kafka. And um, connectors, I think, are often a little bit overlooked. Um, they have a thing called an SMT, a single message transform, um, built into them. And that's like a very, very simple stream processor. Um, it's really an event processor. It just processes one event at a time. So it's quite useful doing, for doing things like transformations when you're pulling data in um, and effectively turning an event source into an event stream. And the other th interesting thing about connectors is that they um, they allow you to look at if you, a, there's a specific type of connector called a change data capture connector. And that lets you listen to the underlying transaction log of a database. So that very accurately turns a database into an event stream. So every insert, every update, every delete is translated into an event. And that's very important if you want to do things like event sourcing use cases. On the other side, we can use connect and with single message transforms to put data into a bunch of different um, uh, data syncs, so it could be databases, Elastic or Cassandra, or it could be something like a, a serverless function. There are APIs which you can use to obviously interact with Kafka and pretty much every language that you can possibly imagine and a set of stream processors, which I'm going to talk about a bit more later. So the roots of Kafka really sit in big data messaging, and if you understand a messaging system, then you at least understand Kafka at a pretty high level. Um, but Kafka provides a number of different properties which are pretty useful. So it has a very good scalability and high availability properties. So we can lose different machines and it will naturally recover. Um, we can also scale these things to many different to, to clusters of hundreds of machines to support very, very high throughput use cases, as well as scaling across different geographies. So for example, we might have something like a mainframe or a monolithic application, which is running on premise. We might, su might suck the data out of that, put it into Kafka, stream it up to the cloud. So we might do something like fraud detection on the cloud, stream it back down again, put it into another database, or alternatively, and probably more appropriately, actually drive uh, an event-driven application off these data sets. We can also store data in Kafka. Um, it's actually at a, 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 a it's a storage level. Kafka stores um, events as a se sequence of messages in an event stream um, uh, on a file. So you append to one end, and then if you read, you just do a sequential scan. And this basically means it's over one for read and over one for write. So you can do um, very efficient operations on old data as well as new data. Effectively, it just comes down to how much caching um, has been done for the, for the newer data in terms of the performance, between, performance comparison between those two. And then finally, we have um, this notion of stream processing. So if you have a big cluster that's full of data, and maybe you're storing a pretty large backlog, so there are production topics with like hundreds of terabytes in them. If you've got hundreds of terabytes in a, in a production topic, you actually need something with quite a lot of grunt to be able to process that. And stream processes allow you to solve the problem of processing data in a continuous way. So it's very different to batch computation. So where this actually came from was Hadoop pipelines, where you have like a, a big batch of messages, you scan through it, and it maybe takes several different hours to come up with a result. 
of stream, stream processing solves the same problem by just doing it continuously. Every time a new, mes new message comes up, it recomputes. So these things obviously run at pretty high scale. Netflix and LinkedIn do more than two million messages per second. Um, so we can definitely scale these things. So I wanted to talk a little bit about serverless functions um, because there's a quite interesting relationship between this idea of a serverless function, which is in many ways similar, but also quite different, and this concept of stream processing. So if you're not familiar with VAS, which um, I think most people probably are these days, but just for those that aren't, um, uh, a serverless function is a very simple function. You can write it in a number of different languages. So you write your function, it might do something like resize an image or send an email. And you upload it to your cloud provider, and um, they are going to manage it all for you, the execution of this function. And you need to configure some kind of trigger, and that trigger will basically create an event. So you might configure an HTTP interface. You might put a message into a message queue. Um, you might use something like a write to an object store or a database to actually trigger an event. Or alternatively, um, you might run these things on a timer. So these are just different ways for you to basically trigger this function. So the, back, the background for this was um, um, on Amazon, um, there was a kind of need or a want or a desire at least to run pieces of processing periodically um, off the back of events that were written or uh, objects which were written to S3. So for example, you might write an image and then trigger a function which resizes that image so that you have a thumbnail. And that sort of workload's pretty periodic. You probably don't want to have to boot a VM just to solve this very simple problem, write a program, etc. So you can do this very simply by submitting a function, and it does the image resizing, puts the resized image into another bucket, and off you go. So one thing about serverless platforms is that they're managed for us. And that means that we don't actually know much about how they actually work, unless you actually go and talk to someone who works on one of them. Some researchers have done a fair bit of analysis by basically testing these things. And um, this paper is probably the best one that I've read. It's called Peeking, Peeking Behind the Curtain of Serverless Platforms. And uh, it goes, it looks at the three major cloud providers. It looks a bit about the internals of how they work. And it compares properties such as uh, startup times. So what's actually happening with a serverless function is it's booting a container, running your function, and then keeps that container hot. And you can actually scale these things out automatically. So um, uh, there's actually a kind of bin packing problem in there in terms of spreading load across these multiple machines um, for the, for these various, for, to process these various different events. So FAS in an upvote show it's fully managed. It's actually running inside a container. Um, it has this very interesting pay-as-you-use model, as you use model. So if you're not doing anything, then it doesn't run. You don't, you, you're not going to pay anything. Um, if there are a backlog of events, it'll actually spawn new functions across different machines. So this gives an interesting level of concurrency. So on AWS, we can have up to a, like a thousand different functions running at the same time if we had like a thousand events that were triggering. So this kind of concept of auto scaling. Each of these functions is relatively short lived, run for maybe five minutes, and um, uh, one of the one of the kind of issues is that there's a relatively slow start up time. And this is um, one of the things that this paper uh, digs into. So 100 milliseconds is probably your best case. 45 seconds is your worst case. Um, and actually, uh, Amazon does it a bit better. It's somewhere in between. And the different cloud providers basically have different trade-offs. So Amazon's actually better at the back-end stuff. Microsoft's better at the front-end stuff. So where is FAS actually useful? Well, it's particularly useful for this notion of spiky workloads. Um, so a good example of this is um, a grid compute. So if you've got a big computational problem, then uh, actually you need to provision a large number of, of VMs or machines. Um, so and and the, and the workloads tend to be quite spiky. So the ability to actually elastically scale, without actually having to pay for um, physical VMs or, uh, or or physical machines which are running constantly, is quite attractive. Um, I actually think that one of the most interesting use cases, though, is actually things that you probably wouldn't bother using parallel computation for. So imagine something like uh, your CI system. Certainly on Kafka, we run our, our builds on like four servers, and it takes maybe like 30 minutes for a build to finish. It's kind of annoying. You want this 
nice, fast feedback loop. So what if you could run and spawn that out on a thousand functions? I mean, running tests, that's an embarrassingly parallel problem. We should be able to parallelize that um, pretty easily. But we probably wouldn't go to the trouble of provisioning a thousand machines for our build server. We might go to the trouble, though, of provisioning a thousand functions. But there are lots of open questions. Uh, Camille Formier mentioned, I wonder if serverless services will become a thing like store procedures, a good idea that quickly turns into massive technical debt. Well, certainly the, 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 the success of serverless as a platform is going to be based on um, the ability of these, these, these providers, these cloud providers, to provide all the things that we actually need as developers to write software. So runtime diagnostics, monitoring, a nice fast deployment loop, easy testing. Maybe if you're working in an IDE, you want like a nice tight IDE integration where things work really well. So currently, things are sort of OK. Maybe not great. But the interesting thing is that this is probably, and we don't really know for sure, it's probably going to get better. So today, it's harder to write in functions because you've got these multiple functions um, flowing around uh, or executing around your ecosystem. Um, so it's probably harder than current approaches. But with three of the biggest companies behind it, maybe, things, these, maybe these things, these various different elements of our developer ecosystem will get better. And that, I think, is actually quite interesting. So Sam Newman, who's basically Mr. Microservices, wrote one of the books on microservices, commented a little while back that people who think serverless will solve all their problems will probably end up sticking all of their stuff in one giant database. Um, this is really because, you know, obviously, in microservices, you tend to separate uh, data into different databases for different microservices. And this is a kind of interest, brings us to an interesting point, which is that how do we actually deal with state in a system which is driven by events? So FAS is an event-driven concept. An event comes in, and you actually you trigger some processing. But it isn't strictly streaming. Streaming is slightly different. So this is sort of the serverless way. Imagine I am, uh, I have, uh, I'm ingesting data from some, invest, uh, some event sources. So at the top, I have customers going through a serverless function and writing that to a database at the bottom. I'm just doing simple ETL of payments into another database. And the, the processing is actually going to go on in this central function, uh, which is going to take an, an order, um, read some customer information, read the corresponding payment, and then send an email. And um, this, is, this, is, this will work very well, and you can scale this out, or to scale this out. Um, but for high-velocity use cases, it's maybe not so great. Um, we might get sort of five to ten messages per second per function for this kind of uh, setup. Stream processing takes a very different approach. So in stream processing, there's basically no network calls. We're going to internalize all our state inside the stream processor. Everything that we need, we're then going to uh, push a variety of different event sources potentially into the stream processor uh, con constantly, and we'll make effectively no network calls. In this case, we're sending an email, um, which is probably not a typical use case for stream processing, but we can obviously do it. That would involve a network call. So we're internalizing everything so we can go really fast. Right? So that's, we'll get like maybe 50,000 to 100,000 messages per second with this kind of setup. So stream processing is really about processing things as fast as possible in much the same way that a database is actually designed to process data as fast as possible. But rather than taking data from a file, where we're actually able to control the organization of the file, we have to take the data from these different event streams, where we actually have less control. So Kafka has two native stream processors. Um, there's Kafka Streams, which is actually a library which ships with the Kafka download. It's just an API like anything else, um, although you can run it as a standalone cluster if you want. And then there's also KSQL. And KSQL is effectively a layer that sits on top of that, um, which provides un unsurprisingly SQL functionality. So this is an example of a slightly ab abridged, for the sake of brevity, uh, KSQL statement, where we're creating a stream. We're going to join orders and payments together. So we're creating a stream, order payments, and we're selecting star, selecting everything from orders and payments, uh, doing the join on a key. And then we're adding a predicate to filter this, this stream. It's a very, very simple idea. Quite database-y in concept. It doesn't actually work quite like a database. What's actually going to happen when I run this query, if there are no events, is nothing. Nothing would happen. And when an event turns up, only then would this query start to push data into, the, data into this order payment stream. 
We can do the same thing if we work in a JVM-based language using the Streams API, and this is actually much richer. So I've extended the example very, very slightly, but it's somewhat similar. So here we are again joining orders um, with payments actually on line three. Uh, we've, we've got a predicate again where we're filtering um, where the order state is, is created. But we're doing something slightly different this time. We're running a function. So we're doing this inside a transformer. So we're calling this uh, emailer, and that's obviously going to send an email. There's another interesting element to this, which is this store. So we're able to basically create a little database of sorts. It's like a key value store. Um, it's actually highly available and resilient, and we'll talk a bit about that later. But we can use that inside our function um, to store state that we might need or update things in a sort of transactional way. So the email then sends an email and then returns um, whether or not it succeeded, and we're going to put that into a, into a topic sent emails. So stream, stream processors have kind of a number of different elements, particularly around stateful operations, which is what I really want to dwell on today, which are quite interesting. And I just want to look at those in a little bit more detail. So if we join two streams, what's actually happening? So this is a little bit like what a database does, but we don't really have any control over the underlying physical um, files or the way that data is distributed. So the, if, if we're joining um, orders and payments, these orders could come up, could, they'll always arrive in order um, uh, with respect to some user. Like we're going to basically shard data to ensure we get very strong ordering guarantees. So Bob's order needs to join with Bob's payment, and Jill's payment needs to join with Jill's order. But these can actually be interspersed in time across different users, because the whole system is effectively asynchronous. We're dealing with an asynchronous world. So the stream processor doesn't actually know what's going to turn up next. And the join is actually done on a key. The key is, a, is something which is effectively built into Kafka. You, you provide this when you write messages to Kafka. Um, so when we join two streams, the streams are going to progress into the stream processor. Um, so Bob's payment turns up first. And it doesn't have anything to match to, so we need to buffer it. And the buffer is actually, um, a, it's actually a key value store. So we're going to put this, this, uh, this first message into the key value store because we don't know what to do with it. And um, we're going to keep it there for some period of time until we can actually find um, a match. And that key value store can actually go onto disk because for big data use cases, we actually may want to buffer for, for a pretty long period of time or at least for a, pretty, uh, for a, a relatively large data set. So next, Jill's order turns up. It also doesn't match, so it gets put in the other buffer. And then the stream continues. Now Jill's payment's about to arrive. It arrives. We get a match. So we can look up the corresponding order, order uh, in the buffer, and we can output Jill's order and Jill's payment um, as a single tuple. Then we progress a bit further. Bob's order turns up. That's able to match against Bob's payment, and we get the stream stream join. So the second streaming um, superpower, as we might call it, uh, is tables. And tables are, in some ways, much easier to understand. In some ways, a little bit less intuitive. So if we join a stream with a table, um, we have a stream of orders coming in, and we, we want to query something like, let's say we want to query customers by their customer ID. Um, we can't just use a stream. If, if you want to find the customer for a particular customer ID or with a particular name, you actually need to do an index search. You need the whole data set in order to, to service that query. So the order, when an order event comes in, we're actually going to need the entire list of customers locally so that we can do that kind of, uh, that, that kind of query by customer ID. And this actually comes up in a couple of different places. So one way of doing this is to have an external event source. So we might have a database of customers. And that would push its data set using something like Kafka Connect uh, into Kafka. This is actually a form of data, data virtualization, not unsimilar to think what things like Presto do. So the data is actually now saved, or at least cached, inside a Kafka topic. And Kafka topics have a, there's a special kind of Kafka topic, which is good at caching data. It's called a compacted topic. So now we can load that data set into what is effectively exactly the same data structure that we're using for buffering. 
So we have a table of customers held locally. And there's kind of two phases to this, at least conceptually, there's two phases to this. There's a phase where for the first time the stream processor ever starts, it's going to load this data um, into this key value store. And then, later, then after it's, it's, it's loaded, it will actually keep that up to date. So now we can take our stream of orders and we can join it to our customers table. Internalizing all this state, and we'll, we'll see what we're going to get out is a set of orders joined to a set of customers. So tables are stateful, um, and this, this can be a problem um, if you say statelessness is not always a good thing. Um, but it's definitely useful if you're a data system. And don't notice with these things, we don't have to use any of these patterns. These are just things that a stream processor lets us do. So is loading tables actually practical? Well, there are a number of things that we can do to actually make, um, make this approach of internalizing state more practical. One thing we can do is actually shard. We spread the stream processor across many different machines just by basically adding new machines and it will scale in and out automatically. Well, the data will scale in and out automatically. Another thing we can do is actually is, is try and reduce the amount of data that we're actually going to store by filtering that data before we save it. So for example, if you just need to look up the customer's email address, you might just keep the email address. And um, when we do these things, to indexing is typically the bottleneck. Uh, RocksDB, that internal store, will do about 10, uh, 10 million rows uh, per, 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 uh, uh, per minute for like a, a um, relatively large object, object size, which is approximately gig, gig, gigabit ethernet speed. And a stream processor, even though it's a simple API, if it's running in a distributed mode, it has several other levels of redundancy built in. So if you have two stream processors running at the same time, two, and these could be two simple microservices, um, or there could be a standalone cluster, then um, all the data that's on one will automatically be backed up on the other one. So if we lose one, it'll actually just catch up a little bit from the log, and then it'll keep going again. It also checkpoints things to disk so that it doesn't have to reload. So typically, the only time you would actually reload data from Kafka is when you kind of start up for the first time. So the next interesting thing is we can apply that same concept of a table, but rather than sourcing it from Kafka, we can actually create it ourselves inside the stream processor. So this is, this is the thing that we talked about earlier, that little store, which is like a little database, which we can just sort of do what we want with. So how does that work? Well, we might have a stream of payments, and this time, rather than the table being sourced event source from Kafka, we're actually going to create the state in the table ourselves. And we, we can literally treat that as a database, do whatever we want with it. Um, but obviously, we might crash, so we have to have some kind of backup, in the worst case scenario. So that table actually gets pushed back into a topic in Kafka where it's stored, and this provides us with high availability um, should we lose, for example, several machines in our cluster at the same time. So this is useful um, for a number of reasons. So one, one interesting use case is like event sourcing. So imagine that I have a stream of payments. So this time we're going to think of payments in a sort of banking context, like your bank account. So we have a stream of payments inside our bank accounts, debits and credits. And we could have a simple stream processor, um, which is going to calculate the balance of our account. Of course, the payment stream wouldn't be per user. We're going to have lots of different payments for lots of different customers inside the same stream. So what we'd actually do is a grouping. So in case equal, it would be like sum the user, so be, sorry, select the user, and then the sum of the payment amount from uh, payments grouped by the user. And that would basically allow us to have um, a credit table uh, which, in which it's keyed by the user and it has the balance um, for uh, each user summed up. So we have this concept of a table which we can write to. And what's kind of interesting about this table is it allows us to look at a whole stream and not just look at it at a, in an event at a time uh, a, a way. It allows us to basically take this stream and introspect the actual behavior or the various different elements which are happening inside that stream. So in the, in the case of the account balance, we're actually looking at a stream and summing it up, projecting it into this concept of a balance. We can also put windows around that. So for example, if we want to break the stream up into maybe a one hour period, because we're interested in looking at things like fraudulent behavior, maybe the, the, the trends of, of payments that we see um, across that one hour period 
to work out whether or not maybe there's a fraud, some fraudulent behavior. That's where we would use windows. So we have this concept of tables. We have this concept of tables that we can write to. Um, and these tables can be written to effectively transactionally. And um, finally, when we have all these different pieces, we can then chain them together to do more interesting things. So chaining operations is actually a little bit like the way we chain um, different commands together with a Unix pipe. So we have one command, for example, the calculate balance, where we have a table which, include, which, which summarizes the balance for each user. And we can actually turn that back into an event stream and push it into another part in our processing chain. So for example, we might check whether or not the user is overdrawn. We have a processor which checks whether the balance is less than zero. If it is less than zero, we might send a notification out onto another topic, which is going to notify the user that, they, that user, the user that they've gone overdrawn. And at the same time, we might write a payment back into their, uh, back into their account, because we're going to, for a bank, so we're probably going to charge them if they go overdrawn. So we can chain these different operations together. But if we're chaining complex operations in that way, then we need some way of actually uh, ensuring correctness of these things. Like if you get charged twice for your overdraft fee, you're probably going to be even more annoyed than you were for being charged the first time. So we can do this with a very simple concept of transactions. So the reason I say it's simple is because to use it, you basically just turn it on. In the stream process, you just enable it and it just works. And what that actually does is it ensures that a whole stream of different operations will happen in a transactional way. So each one of, the, one of these is actually being processed on a single thread. So when we write to a store, we're actually guaranteed a, level of, a serializable level of consistency. And when we chain these different operations to get, together, the various different outputs, the visible changes to the world, are ensured to be transactional. So we know that if we process a payment, we will definitely send any appropriate overdraft notification or any appropriate overdraft charge, and that any of the state which is stored back to Kafka, we know will be um, atomically saved. And transactions in Kafka actually include, um, they're very different to the way we might do transactions in other distributed systems. In some ways, they're similar to transactions in a database. They do include a two-phase commit protocol, um, but it's actually amortized over many different messages. So the performance when you actually run, it, run these things is actually pretty good. So the thing to know about transactions is that they only work in Kafka. So if you call a service, or maybe you uh, write a system out, or you write to basically any other system, you're not going to get those transactional guarantees. only works when you're working inside, inside the stream processor, you're working with Kafka. Now, this is, that, is, that, is actually exactly what a database does. Like a database transaction is really only in the context of a database. So it's very similar in that, in, in, in that regard. So the final one, I'm not going to talk about this too much, is we have this notion of queryable state. So these tables, which we're creating inside the stream processor, we can query those. We can run a query to find out whether or not uh, a certain value exists in one of these tables. And you actually have to expose the interface yourself, but Kafka deals with, or KStreams deals with the routing. Um, between different nodes to tell you so that you know where to actually go to look up a particular value. This isn't supported in KSQL yet. So we talked a bit about serverless functions, we talked a bit about stream processes, and we can kind of summarize that. So serverless gives you this nice property that we can auto scale based on demand. It has this simple programming model, which is quite nice. It's typically stateless relatively high latency because of the overhead of kind of boosting containers and actually the, the underlying infrastructure. And it only supports one event source. It doesn't support joins or things like that. Stream processors are a bit different. They don't have to be stateful. All of these different features that we talked about um, are optional, but they quite often end up being. Certainly in production, people end up having some state because they want to be able to introspect whole streams of data. So. They, they let you join different data sources, they provide correctness even if you fail. And they have quite rich semantics for what is actually known as a, a data flow programming language. So when you chain these things together, the actual programming model you're using is called data flow. Um, doesn't order, order scale, then maybe it's a little bit more complex. 
But statelessness can be a problem. Like we, we kind of know this, right? If we build a traditional application, then we were going to put all of our state in the database, and we're going to have our nice stateless application tier. And our application tier is going to send queries to our database and pull data back up again. And that's going to keep mean that our application can scale really nicely. It makes it easier for us to do deployments, all these kind of things. So is mixing state and logic um, a good idea? That's effectively what we're doing inside a stream processor. Is this actually a good idea? Well, we can um, apply these concepts of event sourcing. Uh, if we apply these concepts of event sourcing to back-end systems, um, then we get an, a kind of interesting trade-off. So if we have a Kafka topic uh, here with uh, various different event sources, so we have an event source um, of, of customers, an event source of orders, an event source of payments, and we're streaming this through, we can use something like KSQL to basically join these different data sets together. So select orders, payments, customers, etc. cetera. Um, and that's applying a projection, much like we would in event sourcing. So in traditional event sourcing, we would actually save the data in a database. So traditional event sourcing is a little bit of different to event sourcing um, in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in a streaming model, because we save the data in a database, and we actually do a query that pulls all the events that we're actually interested out, and then we apply a projection, which creates our view. In a streaming model, we're actually going to stream all the data through um, a data layer like KSQL. We're going to perform the same kind of projection, but we're going to do it on the entire stream. And then we're going to end up with a stream which kind of suits our use case. So in this case, we're providing, applying the projection in KSQL, filtering this down to what the application actually wanted. But in, rather than it being a query where you ask a question and get a response, what we're actually getting is an event stream which suits our particular use case. So in the case of this fraud service, we might manipulate these various different orders. We might chop out data sets we don't need. We might provide aggregations, et cetera, et cetera. So the interesting thing about this is this is a little bit like the way that an application uses a database. Right? So we have this application, this fraud service, and it's using this KSQL server um, to hold its state, to join different event streams together, to do the sort of things that you might do in a database. But it's not a database. It's a streaming engine. It's about pushing data to you. This actually makes quite a lot of sense when we start thinking about building event-driven services, particularly ones um, which run at the back end. So fulfillment, logistics, trade lifecycle, fraud, payment processing. These kind of asynchronous processes that aren't necessarily connected to a user, which are de disconnected, decoupled from the user, and are running in the back, back end of our, of our systems or companies. The other nice thing is that we've separated this concept of stateful and stateless, statefulness and statelessness. So we have our projection. That could be stateful. We might be using tables that we write to. We might be using tables which we have extracted from different event sources. That's the stateful element. But we've turned these various different event streams into these, these maybe fat, maybe specific events, which we're going to push into this stateless layer. So our application there is now nice and stateless, and our stream processor is basically dealing with the stateful problem in just the same way that we would, use, we would push our stateful problem back to a database in a more traditional approach. So this is, um, this is a pattern which is often used in stream processing, actually to give elasticity. So in stream processing, you actually want to have a degree of elasticity. So you can have a stateful layer, and you have a stateless layer. So you basically split operations between the two. And the reason that you do this, obviously, is because uh, on the state of we can basically scale that uh, much more easily. We can deploy to that more easily, um, simply by separating the different operations according to whether or not they're stateful or stateless. Remember that stateless operations, like uh, doing a join, is a little bit stateless. But if we actually only have one event stream, that's completely stateless. So this pattern is actually pretty familiar. It's very familiar to the way that we would normally build an application, stateful. The database stateless upstairs. OK, so somewhere back at the start of this talk, I was talking about serverless functions. Um, and uh, the point we kind of made there was that serverless functions, they're event-driven, um, but, but they're not quite stream processing. So 
So our service functions are, as we said, they're elastic. They have this wonderful elasticity. They have this wonderful pay-for-use model. Um, they're, they're, they're totally stateless because they can only ever really deal with one event stream at a point in time. So a stream processor is a bit different. It's often stateful. But it certainly has stateful elements. It allows us to combine various different event streams together with a pretty rich programming model, whether we're doing that we're using the Java API or whether we're using uh, SQL. But it definitely has this stateful element. So what happens if we combine these things? This is kind of interesting. So we can take this idea of a stream processing layer and, it, and, and treat it as a kind of data layer for a serverless function. Um, so there's a, there's a Kafka connector which will allow you to trigger um, serverless functions so that we can basically pull our data in, in this case, we're obviously we're using this very simple use case of customers, orders, and payments, but we're bringing those together, we're joining them together to create one single event stream. We can push that through a Kafka connector, and then we can actually benefit from some of these nice elasticity and pairs of use properties that we would get with serverless functions. Now, in fairness, the Kafka connector for this is relatively simple. To do this really efficiently, um, it probably needs to have um, better batch computation capabilities, um, notably if in, in, in a serverless function, because you effectively have this, this fairly high latency for each event. To do this at really at scale, you can have to be able to basically batch messages together um, and then push them into a serverless function to get the sort of throughput that we would expect or we would output from a stream processor. But it's certainly an interesting idea. And one thing that hasn't been done yet, but it's also kind of interesting, is that you might be able to extend this to use um, other elements like transactional guarantees, some of the other correctness properties um, which we get um, with a stream processor, in much the same way that an application might inherit transactional properties or does inherit transactional properties from a database. So, traditional application, we split the idea of being stateless and stateful across application layer and database. In a simple event-driven application, we just have a single stream of events. And we can do simple operations, composing together uh, for data from different databases and, uh, and running functions. In streaming, we pull uh, all of the data together in, in a single stream processor, although that might be spread across sharded across multiple different nodes. And we can split the stateful problem and the stateless problem by effectively chaining these operations together. I say, and this would be on, 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 typically on different VMs. So this, if we do this with um, FAS, or if we do this with a serverless function, we are, uh, we're able to blend some of these ideas of linear scalability and data processing, as well as elasticity or, or auto-scaling, all, um, all within the same kind of framework. So in many ways, much like the way we build a traditional application, just designed for event-driven. So back to Sam's quote, people who think serverless will solve all their problems will end up sticking all of their data in one giant database. Um, this may well be true. Uh, I think an interesting idea is whether or not we might end up sticking these inside uh, a stream processor, or certainly inside a streaming platform with these elements of storage, these elements of, these, of the ability to be able to process events um, from many different data sources. Whether or not this will, this, this will really happen, the, the field is a bit too young to tell. So really, that's kind of over to you guys. Um, but certainly, something that I will be watching with a, a degree of interest. So if you're interested in finding out more about these, uh, these, these kind of um, streaming pipelines, uh, particularly around business systems, there's this uh, set of examples. Um, there's a blog post that walks through them. Um, so look at the blog post because it helps you uh, understand how it all fits together. Uh, look at GitHub so you can look at the code. And then there's actually some uh, really nice, uh, there's really, it's now, it's now um, wrapped up really nicely with a set of Docker containers and it includes control center so you can play with case SQL and uh, push data into Elasticsearch and play with how these things um, actually evolve in real time. And if any of these uh, ideas are interesting, um, there's a book uh, which talks about a lot of these concepts of um, event storage, uh, event sourcing, how we chain together event-driven fun functions, and, um, uh, and obviously how we use stream processes. 
so my name is Ben Stopford. Um, also check out Confluent Cloud. And um, thank you very much for taking the time to watch this, uh, this talk.